when Kenneth Tiger gets his ear chopped off. I mean, Kurtzman sculpted all those pieces, and the way we shot that gag was uh, we actually had Kenneth lying on a board, and we just dropped a silver sphere right past his head between him and the camera and yanked the ear off with a piece of monofilament. So everything was shot on an angle, and then when you looked at the footage played back, it looked like he's standing there, and the ear, you know, the, the, the ear got yanked off. The, the interesting thing about all the Phantasm films is the balls always become more technologically advanced. It's just not good enough in the first movie to just have a sphere that sticks in your head and sucks your brains out. Now it has to be able to chop your ears off and chop you up. And then, of course, there was the Super Ball, which was the gold sphere. And that enters into the guy's stomach and goes up through his shirt. And then we see it come out his mouth. Bob sculpted this big sort of fleshy face with a bunch of little serrated edges and we actually created, Steve Patino created the drill part of the ball with all the blades that was hooked up to a, a little battery. So the actor was sitting there wearing the, a big prosthetic with his neck and his jaw distended and then the, the, the gold ball with the little motor and then the blade so that off camera we could just push the two wires together and go and just kind of turn a little bit. It was really cool. There's a shot where the silver sphere hits Angus in the head. <laughs> we had a fake head of him. Foam latex skin, which is simple. Nothing was, Nothing was radio controlled back then. It was all just cable. And oh. the idea was that we had one shot where we pushed this creature out uh, that was like this kind of little purple leech looking thing with little pinchers on the end. So we pushed it out and then it would be, it would be moving around. And then, of course, he grabs James LeGro. So he's going, uh, and the little creature's there kind of trying to get at him. And then I think he reaches up and, and pulls it off, if I recall, and then yellow ooze spurts everywhere, of course. <laughs> of course, the sequence where the tall man um, sort of explodes uh, at the end of the movie, it was the same thing. We, we created a variety of makeup stages, and this was Mark's baby. Mark spent most of the film working on the prosthetics for Angus's face, but there were various stages that he went through with bladder makeups with um, ooze going up to them and I know that Mark and Bob Kurtzman applied all that all the makeup. Okay that's fine. Ready and action. Ah! <laughs> you would see the blisters appear and then he would start to the, the flesh would start to drip off I even remember them using for the neck piece they actually took, went to the Ralphs and picked up chicken skin and off of a chicken breast and super glued it to the appliance so you had a kind of a meaty piece of flesh hanging off the neck. It was a really good sequence the way that it was designed and directed by Don. We also made a resin uh, skeletal hand and then we put that hand into the mold and filled the mold with colored gelatin and then painted the hand so that we mounted the hand to the wall and got one of those big industrial heaters and shot the hand melting at three frames a second so that the hand did the old brrr, Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of just dripped away. So in the sequence, you see 
you see his face start to ooze, and then you see these pustules appear, and then yellow ooze shooting out, and then his hand melts, and then we made a, a face of Angus with vacuform eyelids and chambers behind him that was filled to uh, tubes with air and yellow goo so that we could hit the button and it would blow the eyes out. So we were, you know, we were sort of borrowing from a lot of the movies that had influenced us uh, up to that point. You know, I mean, then it, it was Scanners and Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and all the bladder makeups, Dick Smith. You know, Mark Chiltern was always very, very heavily influenced by Dick Smith. And you can really see it in the effects with the bladder makeups and the melting hands and the, the eyes being blown out. I just remember how, how much fun it was. I was up in Morningside Cemetery, and, and I cut off a finger of the tall man, and it changed it into this thing! <laughs> Where'd it go? Oh. That would have been, that was the eve of the last film that I would do as a freelance, because we started K&B almost Right around the ending of Phantasm II, Howard and Bob and I had gotten contacted by Scott Spiegel and Sam Raimi to do this movie called Night Crew, which became the first K&B film. Really, really, really low budget. I think they paid us $3,000 to do all of the makeup effects in the whole movie. We would work at Showstrom's during the day, and then Kurtzman and I would drive from South Pasadena and shoot all night with Scott and then go back to Showstrom's in the morning. And there was even a couple times when we were supposed to be on set in Chatsworth for Phantasm. And I remember a couple nights when Bob actually fell asleep because we, were, uh, we had worked all night. And Mark would be like, what's the matter with him? I don't know. I don't think he's feeling really well. We were able at that point to break the dreaded catch-22 of, well, you can't supervise your own show unless you've supervised a show. So by 1990, I mean, literally within a couple years of the company's inception, we had done Gross Anatomy, Dances with Wolves, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Halloween 5, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Tales from the Dark Side. From 88 to like 92, 93, all of a sudden, it peppered in between a lot of these other films that would be something like Misery or City Slickers or, you know, mainstream movies. Um, by 95, 96... It was, you know, we had done Reservoir Dogs, we'd done Pulp Fiction, we were about to start Spawn and Men in Black, and all of a sudden we were doing big movies. We've been tremendously fortunate, and, and uh, our relationships with guys like Sam Raimi and John Carpenter and Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino, who we've worked with on numerous films. I mean, and Don, of course, you know, I mean, we've done, we've done probably four projects with Don Coscarelli. We even went back on Phantasm IV and did a couple gags for him because we've been friends with Don since 1987. After that, we went on, we did Baba Hotep, and we're doing a, a show with Don right now. So, so it's, uh, it's really rewarding. Yeah.